Okay, so I guess you can see my screen now. Yes, can I... from this side is fine. Wait. Yeah. Okay. So uh, first, um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you for, for finding a way to make the sound work also. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to be here today, even if remotely, to share with you some of my recent research interests. So first thing first, let me, let, let me introduce myself. So um, I'm someone who comes from applied mathematics and in particular geometry processing, which is basically the fact that you turn real world objects into virtual representations, and then you try to analyze them. And here you can see one, one of the projects we did where we tried to, when we, we went to a museum, a uh, Roman museum, and we did some acquisitions uh, with a triangulation laser scanner, and we were able to reconstruct the surface. So that's something which we do uh, a lot. And um, of course, then once you have the shape, then you can analyze it, you can extract curvatures, you can extract features. And for a long time, we did that in a uh, handcrafted way. And now we are tend to benefit more and more from all the nice research which is done in, in mostly in, in machine learning and image processing and try to adapt it to a geometric case. Um, the problem is that there is no universal representation, no universal way of acquiring a surface as there are for images. If you want to acquire an image, an image, you just take your camera, you just go to a location, you take a picture, it will be an array of pixels, uh, black and white or, uh, or a gray level or a color, but it will still be, the structure will be the same. It will be a, more or less a, a, an array of pixels. And when you do acquisition with um, with a laser scanner, then you can have uh, with a when you do surface acquisition, there are several ways of, of acquiring surfaces: triangulation laser scanners, which basically measure on a, on a camera the impact point of a laser, a lidar, which basically measures the um, time of flight of a, of a laser array, multi-use stereoscopy, depth cameras, and there are many ways of acquiring geometries geometry. And um, the issue is that each of the uh, each of these uh, acquisition way of, of the, uh, different ways of uh, acquiring a surface yields very different types of data. For example, here on the bottom on the left, you can see a, um, a shape which is acquired with the triangulation laser scanner closed range, which means that it's very, it's actually quite um, um, it's actually quite clean. There is no noise, almost no noise, very few outliers. Uh, if you look at the, in the middle, it's a uh, whole city which is acquired through a, uh, several uh, uh, lidars. You can see the places where the li lidars were located in that the center of this uh, big circles on, on the floor. You can see that there, is, there are missing data, there are moving objects, so it will be a whole different, ty different types of, uh, of artifacts. And if you do stereoscopy as uh, on the on the right, there will be much more noise, but you will also recover textures which are not uh, usually captured by lidar lidar scanners, lidar scanners. And um, so, not only is there such a diverse way of acquiring surface surfaces, there is also also the issue that there is no universal way of representing a surface. You can think of uh, reconstructing a mesh, you can think of considering only the point sets, you can um, do some uh, Bezier reconstruction, NURBS reconstruction, but all of these type of, uh, of surface of surface representations are different and there is it's not an easy issue to to an easy problem to solve this um, to deal with all these type of, of representations. So uh, what is uh, what are typical problems? So the most usual one is noise. So when it's uh, which you, we usually assume it's posi uh, is positive, uh, it's additive, sorry, uh, and centered, such as uh, on, on, on the figure on the on the left. But there is some kind of noise which is even more complex, which is a um, 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 which is noise which has a pattern which might be due to the uh, to the acquisition direction, and uh, it will be very hard for any algorithm to distinguish between this directional noise and uh, the, the, a pattern, a feature of the geometric surface. 
And of course, it can, there can be outliers. For example, on the right, you have a uh, aerial photographies, which shielded uh, uh, by multi-use stereoscopy um, reconstruction of a, of, a, of a city. And you have a lot of spurious points which appear. And you can have, of course, missing data. And all of these issues, we usually dealt with, uh, with them with handcrafted features, with handcrafted methods, uh, assuming uh, some priors which we assumed was reasonable, such as um, uh, zero Laplacian or uh, small uh, total variation norm. But what now is coming in is that we have, uh, we can actually deal with these issues by leveraging database, database prior, by learning a database prior to, to, to deal with all this. So uh, one more thing I'd, I'd like to point out on the, on the topic uh, of uh, surfaces versus or shapes versus uh, images. When you have an image, it's basically a function defined on a grid. And recovering a pixel is basically finding out what is the true value of this function on the, at this precise location on the grid. It's very difficult because um, you have different objects. It's, there, are, there are a lot of occlusions, a lot of, uh, of textures, a lot of can be noise also, but it's still one, a 2D function basically. And here, when you're dealing with, with surfaces, it's very different because you don't have this global parameterization. It's actually an, an open, uh, still a very, a very active field to, to parameterize a surface. So what you have is something which is completely, um, which lives in, which, uh, which is uh, local, locally it can be 2D, but it lives in an ambient space, uh, ambient space which is 3D. And also there are a lot of different complexities. So if you see on the, on the left, you have a, 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 a shape from the Singita and K database. And here you have a shape which has almost no geometric detail, but which has a very high genus. And it's very different in terms of complexity to the, to the shape you can see in the middle, where you have actually a shape which is homeomorphic to a, to, to a sphere, but which has a lot of geometric details. And on the right, you have a mix of both, both geometric and topological complexities. And this calls for different type of, of, uh, of, a, um, of algorithms. Either you deal with topology, you deal with geometry, but it's hard to do everything at once. OK, so since you have no grid structure, of course, you, have, uh, you cannot benefit from, from equivariant translation. So basically, if you move in a direction from a point, uh, in an image, if you're not on a, on a boundary, you can find, you, you will move to the to the right, and you will see another pixel. Now, if you move by a translation v in a point set from a, from a, from a point to another point, and if you do the same translation for for uh, for x one instead of x zero, there is probably will you won't find anything. Maybe you went just out of the surface. You you, you the, the surface was not flat at this point, so you just went out, or maybe there was an acquisition hole. Uh, so there's there's a lot of uh, of issues with no grid structure plus irregular sampling, plus occlusions when scanning, of course. So what is a good representation for working with this type of geometric data? For machine learning, there was a lot of um, uh, early work on trying to define things which would benefit from grids, but still be still work on the three D information, such as working with a 3D voxel grid or uh, doing a multi-view, uh, like doing multi-view doing multi rendering plus processing the, multi the, the different views by a traditional control network, net neural network and pooling to, to, uh, to get a recognition result, good recognition results, for example. But you need to adapt, each network needs to be adapted to each representation. So it's actually quite tedious. Um, so there are methods which deals with point sets, which basically are the raw output of, uh, of, of acquisition devices, but which are sparse, not watertight, and so on. Um, meshes, so basically which is a reconstructed uh, mesh out of a point set. It's quite efficient to work with that because it has a graph structure, 
but it needs to be pre-computed -pre and it's not entirely a graph. It's, well, it's a special type of graph because it has to be too manifold. And then there is a, uh, a type of representation which has gained some structure recently, which is implicit representation. And here I would like to, to focus um, part of my talk to, to this kind of representation. So implicit representation is not something which is new. Um, it has been used for long, very long time uh, in geometry processing, in shape design, um, for example, for uh, in, in con constructive solid geometry, you will add primitives to build a shape out of their implicit representation. So you, you would combine primitives and represent the shapes through these primitives. Then um, in geometry processing, there is a whole a whole domain basically which deals to which deals with uh, reconstructing a mesh from a set of points. And the most efficient methods uh, in that in that area are methods which take a uh, which um, which first build some um, some 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 implicit field and then so some three D function defined in the ambient space and then you use machine cubes to extract for example machine cubes to extract the three D mesh. So uh, maybe uh, the most uh, the, the most well known method for that is uh, uh, the method of uh, Poisson surface reconstruction and its variants by uh, Misha Kajdan. But there are a lot of different uh, ways of uh, of uh, of building the, the the implicit potential, the implicit uh, the implicit field, um, and it's a long standing problem actually to find a good function basis for representing the sine the sign distance function or the implicit function. For um, uh, in uh, for machine learning, it has basically been rediscovered or it has been brought to light again uh, by well, around five years ago, but by um, uh, papers like uh, Deep SDF or Occupancy Network, where you, you train an, a neural network to represent a shape. So it can be either based on a database, so you, you acquire some shape prior, or you can do it also by, by, uh, by shape. And it can be used directly for rendering, or you can just uh, focus on, uh, and you can, it has mainly been used for, for reconstruction the surface, for reconstructing the surface, or just to visualize it. And here you can see uh, on the bottom, you can see a uh, different, the idea of the surface. The surface is a zero level set of some function defined in the ambient space. So now you have, once again, a function defined in an Euclidean space for which you are going to extract, on which you can work. You can do some, some, some optimization, which is easier maybe than what you can do for a manifold surface. And uh, you, can, you will be able to recover the surface in the end. So it's quite handy. Actually, it was it's clearly linked to what was uh, done with the famous uh, NERF paper uh, in the idea that um, you use a single network to model a scene and you train it to fit a scene by feeding it input images and trying to make it uh, at, and, tra and training it to 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 model the, the a, 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 a radiance field. And here it's kind of similar. Actually, you feed the neural network with some points you have acquired, and you try to make it uh, as a, um, uh, uh, and you try to 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 have it learn efficiently a function in the entire ambient space. And uh, what what uh, what interested me in this uh, in this type of representation is to see what we could do with implicit functions, with implicit representations to analyze the shape. Because rendering is, may, may most, or most method will, will work for rendering. And my, 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 my issue was uh, how can we, well, well my, my, the challenge was how can we use this, this nice features, nice uh, definition to extract some, um, some, some information about the shape uh, and, uh, and can we do it in a better way than what we do with axiomatic, as, uh, with uncrafted methods? And, and the, the problem we were interested in more, more precisely was to uh, extract the medial axis of a shape. So 
um, the idea is to extract topological data from shapes, so medial axis, even when there is noise or missing data. And that's something for which uncrafted methods don't work so well. So that's where we hope with a neural, neural uh, representation, we can do something better. And the, the simple um, idea, the key, well, the, the, the key idea is that all the topological information about the shape is actually included within the sign distance field. So we are going to focus on uh, implicit representations where the function is the sign distance field. You do not need, actually, you do not need to be the sign distance field for other applications, but here that's what we decided. And how do we represent this sign distance field? In this case, let's try to see what we can do with implicit neural representation. So let me uh, go back to the definition of a medial axis. A medial axis is of a shape in 2D. Well, the general definition is that it's a, is that it's a set of points uh, uh, who have at least two distinct nearest neighbors on the shape surface. So in 2D, it will be a set of lines. And if, it, if the shape has features, then the lines will go through uh, toward the corners, uh, to the, to the, toward the feature corners. Um, and in 3D, it will not be linear. It can be both linear and uh, surface, locally surfacic, but uh, it's the same dissemination of holes. So it's a set of points where, uh, which has uh, at least two distinct nearest neighbor on the surface. Uh, it's a uh, it's actually an, ar an area which has gained a lot of work for the, the past 30 years in geometry processing. And uh, mostly people, uh, uh, an important type of skeleton which has gathered a lot of work is extracting a curved skeleton. A curved skeleton, it's not exactly defined as a medial axis, but you look, you try to look for a, uh, something which represents a shape but which will only be uh, a set of curves. So here on the, on the right, you can see, for example, for the end, you will have uh, the, the, the final set of curves will be uh, um, for, for a hand. And it's, it's actually not as well defined as the medial axis. So in only real mathematical definition is the medial axis as, as I defined it. There's also a lot of methods coming for directly from computational, from computational geometry by computing for noise subcomplex and so on. It has also been, been studied a lot from this uh, point of view. And interestingly, 2018, there was a paper which uh, extracted, extracted the medial axis uh, already from the side distance field through a voxelization. And the important thing is that it came with boundaries on the uh, on, 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 on bonds, on theoretical bonds, on the, the error made by the estimation with respect to the real theoretical medial axis. So it was quite nice. And it worked with uh, discretization of the side instance field. So the result is usually uh, very verbose. You have a lot of vertices on this axis. So usually we like to compress it to have something which are which is sparser, which is more, um, which is better to 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 look at. And for compression, compression of medial axis is uh, a whole um, also has a lot of work being done on. And especially I talk about it later, but. Uh, there's a paper called Coverage Axis in 2022, which was quite interesting with that regard. So what are we going to do? We're going to, do? We're going to work with um, a point set with oriented normals. We are going to train uh, an implicit neural representation with a specific training, which I'm going to describe. Then we're going to extract skeletal points and then a skeletal complex. And what we are, going to re we are really interested in is how we are going to train this uh, uh, implicit neural representation. So our set of input data is, uh, is a set of points, xi and i. And i is a normal to the surface. xi lies on the surface. And formally, what we're looking for is a uh, function u, which is continuous, which is almost everywhere smoothly differentiable. Almost everywhere. Almost is very important here, such that the gradient of this uh, function, e. the norm of the gradient of this function is one. It uh, the it should be zero on the surface, and the gradient 
uh, of the function should be uh, should align with the normal on the surface as well. So this is only a simple econol equation. So this is, the, this is what is called the econol equation. And in 2020, it was turned into a loss by uh, in a paper by Bro and colleagues. And uh, what you can see with this loss, which works, uh, which I writes quite simply, that the first term, so you see, so you sample, um, the first term is a sum over the, the, the data points and you the loss favors that the function is close to zero uh, near uh, on the on the on the surface point xi that the gradient of the function should align with the normal plus the second term which is quite interesting is actually what ensures that the economic equation is satisfied everywhere so not only on the surface so you, what you do is that you do some Monte Carlo sampling in the ambient space, and you want the gradient to be the norm of the gradient to be close to zero, and this loss uh, is what it, so tries to basically solve um, the Econol equation. Actually, it's not far from what you can see when you do uh, a physical inform physically informed neural networks. It's the same principle. You have a the um, uh, a, a, an equation, a, a differential equation, and you solve it. Uh, one interesting thing is that our function will be a neural network, will be represented by a neural network. That's the choice we're doing here. And because we're making this choice, uh, we, and we, we can compute the gradient simply through auto differentiation through the network. So it's actually quite simple, quite efficient to, to minimize this loss. But there's a catch. Actually, the Econol equation is not well defined in a way that it has an infinite number of solutions. Why? Because you can change uh, you can change the sign of the function as many times as you want, as you can see on, on, on the right. So um, it's it's a, it's a West, it's a problem which is well known, and there is a there is a whole a theory to, to overcome that, which is called the viscosity solution theory, which allows to select the right solution. So you have existence of this solution, but to actually build it, you need something a little um, practical. And the way to do that is to use a smooth econol equation, which basically adds, uh, adds the uh, uh, epsilon times Laplacian to the, to the econol equation. So you replace a norm of the gradient is equals to one by norm of the gradients minus epsilon times the Laplacian equals to one. But it's it's not very practical. Uh, we found it not to be not very practical in uh, in uh, uh, for for uh, for training the neural network. And the consequence of that is that blobs may appear. It's not very important when you're doing rendering or, or uh, when you're just doing that for visualization because it's constrained near uh, it's if you, if you think of the, of the if you look at the, the equation it actually it's constrained near the surface by gradient of u equals to the normal but remember we're going to look for the medial axis so we need it to be stable far away from the surface and that's a place where it's not always so stable, especially when you have noise. So another question is, which neural network should we use? Um, usually, well, in the early uh, methods doing, uh, doing, this kind of, uh, doing this kind of approaches, um, the, 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 the networks was simply a, an MLP with ReU activation functions, not even very deep, not, not, uh, not even very uh, uh, deep, just uh, six layers and not many neurons per layer. So it's it's quite a, a simple, a light network, let's say. But the issue is that if you take a really a really U activation function, then your gradient will be piecewise constant in the, in, in the ambient space. And the medial axis is precisely places where the gradient is undefined. So of course it will, it will uh, it will not be easy to, to detect it if the, uh, if the gradient stays piecewise constant. And in 2021, um, in the side, there was a siren paper which proposed to replace the real U activation functions with sign activation function, which, are, which is, let's say, smoother and allows to 
I have uh, non-constant gradients and uh, uh, which we will uh, choose in our in our um, in our setting. So now we are not looking exactly for the sine distance, but for a smooth surrogate of the sine distance function. Because now with the sine activation function, we have a neural network which is infinitely uh, differentiable. So it's uh, it's not exactly it's it's a different kind of problems that. Uh, the one we were we set out to 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 solve, and the medial axis is not places where the gradient is not defined, but it's zeros of the gradient. So places where basically the function will go will just decrease, assuming it's negative inside the shape, and then it will re-increase uh, once it crosses the medial axis. And our uh, rationale for for trying to regularize that is to say that we wanted to minimize the measure of the medial axis, so of the zeros of the gradient set. So what we did is use a total variation term for the gradient norm of the gradient, because uh, we were we tried to make it as um, constant as possible, but we still wanted to change in a very localized way. So actually, it turns out it's more complicated than that, because uh, you can find counterexamples where the actual medial axis does not minimize the, the measure of the zeros of the gradient set across all possible solutions. But uh, we it's still it's a it's a good um, it still was a good intuition because actually if you if you do some very easy math, what you see is that the TV terms actually favors that the function has no second order differential content along the gradient line. So what it means is that you enforce it to have no curvature, so have to be basically constant uh, across, uh, along the gradient lines. So it's something which we want to, which makes sense because we want it to be basically one and then change in a very localized manner. So what is the total loss? The total loss is adding our econo loss, the surface loss, so uh, which is basically the same as before and our TV loss. And then we also add something which is quite, okay, which is very important uh, when there is uh, missing data or noise and to, to set out on a, in a good path throughout the optimization is to take a point in the ambient space and to measure the distance to the, to the closest point of the surface when the surface is given as a point set, so the closest point, and, uh, and try to uh, have in the first steps of the optimization to try to make uh, the distance as close as possible to this to this distance. And of course, after some epochs, we just drop it to allow for the uh, for the network to to use its own regularization and uh, not be hindered by this very coarse estimation. And everything uh, tends to come to behave to behave well. So what happens now? What happens when we have noise? When we have noise, so we, we had uh, additive noise in terms of, uh, I, I'm giving here the percentage in terms of the shape diagonal. And if we if you take the, consider the SDF, then you see that when you add increasing noise, our uh, result is much more stable than what you get with both um, um, uh, the, the implicit, uh, uh, so the, the MLP uh, version or the siren version. And, um, but okay, so close to the surface, it's, it behaves quite okay. But there are, if you look at the siren results, there are a lot of inversion, which, uh, which, um, which make it uh, complicated to, for, for our purpose. Okay, I'm just going to go. So if you look at the, the gradient, you see that the zeros of the gradient are very well localized or better localized with our method than with the others. So that's places where it's dark blue, basically. And if you look at the second order derivative, so gradient of the norm of the gradient, you get uh, a much better uh, localization as well. And then after that, there is a uh, small, a, um, there is something we need to do to, to, to reconstruct. We have, the, we have the SDF, the sign distance field, which is learned. Now we need to extract the skeleton from it. And to do that, we start by sampling points uniformly on the surface through a set of new, uh, Newton steps. And then afterwards, we do um, GPU skeleton tracing, which basically is take a point which you have sampled on the surface, 
uh, cast array, which is in the inverse direction to the normal, takes the first point, which is uh, on the opposite side. So when the, the value, uh, well, you, you, you sample points on the array, and when the, in the first point where the value of the sign distance function is positive again, you stop, you split the rest of the, the segment between P and QI0 in small bins, and you take the, the points, the sample points, which is closest, which has a smaller um, gradient value. And this means that you have found a point which is not so far from the medial axis. And that can be done very efficiently on the GPU, so it's, it's quite easy. Afterwards, there is this, uh, you need to compress and reconstruct the actual mesh, the actual medial axis mesh. And to do that, we employ a technique which is uh, which is uh, was uh, uh, introduced by Du in 2022, which is basically turning this problem into a coverage matrix problem, solving it with the mixed inter integral linear problem, and finding thus a subset of points which best represents the surface. And the results are uh, well uh, quite good looking. So it, you can see it mixes both. Uh, uh, linear and uh, surface skeletons. And now if you compare it with uh, with other types of, uh, of, uh, of skeletons, it works, uh, well, it's, it works decently well. It, see, it's completely, uh, it's okay. But if you have, what is important is that if you have missing data, for example, here you have a lot of, of, uh, of uh, the shape is only partially acquired. And what you see that if you take other uh, methods like uh, which were which are un uh, not machine learning based, then you fail to recover uh, the handle of the of the vase, or or here you have some spurious thing which is created. And uh, also, if you have noise, you can also you also have a better stability with our method than with uh, traditional methods. And when there is like, or again when there is miss missing data, you see that. It tends to have some in, to impose some regularity on the curvature of the of the skeleton, which is completely, of course, lost by coverage axis because it's not designed for that. And the most important thing in our um, in our project was to check whether it was robust or not, and we found that even with a kind of a huge number, well, a noise which is uh, not quite high, we were stable, whereas other, other methods were not able to uh, to retrieve um, something which was, uh, um, which uh, which looked like the skeleton of the shape. And if you replace, if you do the same comparison with, with other types of uh, implicit neural uh, representation, you see that it's, uh, it's it works not so, not so well with, uh, uh, with noise. Also, uh, also uh, it works very well for 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 low low amounts of of noise. Okay, so what uh, did we um, did we take out of this uh, this project? Um, is that we we introduce a stronger regularization principle. Genus estimation just can can follow directly from it because once you have the skeleton, the genus can be just uh, uh, estimated from the skeleton. And you have the code, we got a replicability system, so everything is replicable and you can just test it if you want. And of course, the question that we'd like to investigate, or maybe if, if we have time, we will investigate, is can we do better with one Lipschitz networks, which are networks which ensure that uh, the norm of the gradient is exactly one. And I think there are some things to do there, might be not as efficient, but I think it's, it, there probably is something uh, interesting to do. Okay. So that's, uh, let me skip that because I won't have time to talk about that. So I talked about no implicit neural representation, but that's, you might might say that I was not feeling my, uh, uh, I, I was not uh, doing uh, what I promised I would do, which is to talk about deep learning really, not as a, uh, just as a, uh, an optimization tool. And of course, we can ask: Can we exploit? Can we can we do something better than just using neural prior? And can we exploit a learned prior for a data on a data set? And of course, that's an that's a question which uh, which has raised a lot of interest. So for that, we need to have a good generic universal shape representation, and we also need to have, and it's uh, that's crucial to the success of these methods, a data set of, of diverse shapes. 
And let's look at, let's have a look at our the current data sets we have. I I uh, I just uh, printed two examples of the of uh, very famous data sets, so ShakeNet and uh, NPI Faust. And um, the issue is that we have a lot of data sets which represent, let's say, everyday uh, things like uh, uh, chairs, um, people, um, sofas, and so on. So we actually, we are in geometry processing, we are starting to be experts on, on furnitures, but um, uh, that's uh, maybe not uh, what we'd like to be expert on. And if you compare what uh, what is uh, what else shapes, what are the shapes which are depicted in that in these data sets with the type of shapes we would like to analyze, which can have, as I said, various topologies, low uh, geometric, um, low geometric uh, noise, or uh, low geometric details, or very high geometric details. Details so. Uh, the problem is that what we have for data sets is not completely representative of the variety of detailed shapes that we can acquire. And the issue is that it's far less, it's far more complicated to have a representative data set for shapes than it is for images. You cannot just say, I'm going to, to scrap the internet for whatever images and just put it in, the, in a billion image database. It's not as straightforward. So let's take the problem a little different, differently and try to see what geometry can bring to image analysis. And um, the, the problem so we have is that there are lots of the, the, the thing, the problem we want to look at is that we have a lot of um, data sets where there are 3D plus images. And um, so, for example, ScanNet, Kitty, but that's only to name two of them. There are like a, a much more data set than that. And the 3D can be can be acquired by multi-view reconstruction, depth camera, lidar. It depends on the data set, and it means that, for example, if you take this um, this scene here, you take a picture from this uh, from uh, from the from the bottom right, and you acquire a picture. And then if you take, you consider uh, you have a LiDAR, which also acquires some, some palm clouds, you will have a set of points. And you can, of course, represent, represent it as a, um, a depth image, but uh, it's, it's basically a, a set of points, so geometric information. <coughs> so um, we are going to see this issue to, 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 to work on these data sets in a segmentation purpose, for a segmentation purpose. And for segmentation, of course, you need to have some supervision and you need for supervision, you, to, you need to have uh, some annotations. So it's um, the problem of annot annotating um, a data set is that it's usually much easier to do it in 2D, like working on an image, than to do it in 3D. Uh, where uh, you need to uh, feed geometric models and then uh, out crowdsource a lot of things. And you have an annotation which might not be entirely um, correct. Uh, and it's, it's much, much more tedious. So it's a much more time consuming and tedious process to annotate in 3D than in 2D. So our idea is that can we keep the problem 2D, like use a 2D supervision and enhance the data, the image data, with a, uh, a, with geometry to improve um, the, the, the results of the seg uh, of the segmentation. So I will just uh, give you some some cues on the on the on the uh, some some markers in the in the state of the art. Of course, uh, it might not be entirely up to date because the paper was published last year, so uh, it's only it's very partial. So there are uh, a lot of methods which basically redefine convolution, so like shape con uh, redefine convolution to work for both uh, RGB plus depths. So take the depths into account in the uh, in the uh, in the convolution. You can also try to have different modalities like depths plus uh, plus image uh, run through two different networks and then fuse them as some steps or use a transformer to exchange information between depth and, and, and image. 
And uh, for 3D segmentation, uh, if you have both 2D and 3D supervision, you can use uh, image information, you can use image features to try to enrich the 3D information by image features uh, to improve the 3D segmentation. So for 3D segmentation, these uh, features can come from multi-view, for example, as, a, as in, the, in these two examples. And then the features are uh, uh, reprojected by to 3D to, to, to be uh, then um, um, segmented by a 3D network. Uh, you can also work, try to work on 2D segmentation directly, as we will do. And uh, maybe when well, two of the most, uh, I think, interesting uh, methods are BPNet, which basically runs both the 2D uh, data and the 3D data in different um, uh, in, in different um, networks, and then uh, exchange information without the uh, the, the levels of uh, of uh, of abstraction. And there is also a very important, very interesting work, which basically tra trains a, um, a 2D network to mimic 3D features to improve the 2D segmentation. So both use 2D and 3D supervision. And the issue is that you, you get very heavy networks. So that's uh, 100 million parameters for PPNet and above 66 million parameters for, for the USR methods. So it's actually quite heavy. And what we want to see is, can we use geometry? Uh, can we leverage geometric information to improve 3D segmentation with light networks? Meaning that we don't want it to be, uh, to, to, to put an overhead, a too high over, overhead uh, with the, uh, uh, to, the, to a 2D network. So can we avoid 3D annotation? Can we work end-to-end -end with 2D annotation and avoid 3D annotations, right? And uh, our setting is a set of registered images and geometry information. So we will not work on how we can register image to geometry. We will assume everything is done. We have an image and uh, geometric information with it. So actually the architecture we, we, we worked with is very simple. And the idea is that it's, it's actually generic so that we, you can combine a 2D network out of the shelf with a 3D network, most well, out of the shelf if you want. And uh, the overhead of combining both is extremely light. What we do is that we take uh, the points which lies in, in a field of view, of the, of the field of view of the camera. We run it through a uh, 3D encoder. We get a set of features, per point features, and we concat we project them uh, on an image and we merge them with the RGB information. And then we, fa we feed uh, the uh, this merged image, so uh, with uh, 64 um, channels through whatever network you like for your 3D segmentation. And uh, then we get the segmentation output and we can drive everything, train everything only with the 2D segmentation loss. So let's forget about the 3D annotation. So um, one question which might uh, which is interesting is how can we uh, which points should we analyze and we chose to extract all points which lies in the camera first run so not not only the points which are visible but all the points it it's, uh, allows to compute a description per point and our default is simply point net and which we which we even simplified further because we didn't it turned out we didn't need the spatial transformers point net has two spatial transformers one in 3D and one in feature space. And we just removed them to, we found that it was better to just remove them because uh, the camera is not, is not taking, is taking a picture uh, with basically the, uh, which is the left is on the left, the right is on the right. It's, uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward, right? And um, to, mer to merge information, we just concatenate the 3D features and your geometry image and uh, run it through an MLP. Of course, uh, the geometry images are actually very sparse. So when there is no information, the MLP was, uh, will just extend RGB information to 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 fill uh, to fill uh, to to get a, a description which is only based on on, on the RGB information. And uh, our default network, uh, our default 2D network is UNET34, which is a very 
uh, weak baseline, actually. But our goal is once again to show that with weak baselines, we can even do something interesting. So here, for example, is an example of what using geometry with uh, with uh, this weak unit 34 baseline can do. So on the left, you can see the RGB image and uh, ground truth and what is output by uh, unit 34 and what we have when you when you add when you, when you add uh, the geometry information and you can see that you recover uh, much better the 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 shape the close up there is the segmentation is much more meaningful so that's purely visual so it's uh, there is definitely it's better to have a look at at the numbers themselves so here is a set of uh, comparisons with a um, with our uh, with uh, several methods. And here uh, you can see that uh, even using sorry, even using a uh, point net with uh, unit 34 on a point cloud, which is just the depth image, it allows to improve uh, the, uh, it allows to improve the, the, the average intersection of a union. And if we use uh, the best uh, our point net with uh, with uh, a, a much much better um uh, a much much better um 2d network then we get um uh, a quite a high uh, average intersection of our union uh, that's also the scanet data set we tested a lot of different uh data sets and uh, that's in the paper so i will we'll focus here on the scanet data set and what is important is that it's gives better results but it gives better results at a cost which is much lower right it's actually uh it's a, it's very very small. It's a very small number of parameters compared to competitors, and it trains for much less time. And it's also generic insofar as you can uh, you can uh, combine a different uh, uh, version of uh, of uh, the three D networks. For example, here we tested on the three D networks, and you can see that adds for a for it uh, it uh, adds a lot of uh, it allows for. Uh, for a huge uh, average uh, intersection of our union gain in all these settings. So if you take UNET just under RGB, you get 55.5 MIOU. And if you use L point net, if you add L point net, you have a gain of 10.6 in MIOU for a cost in a uh, in a uh, for a cost in a number of parameters, which is actually quite low. So um, you have uh, point net is actually very very light for for a network. Um, so, what uh, is the take home message of this uh, this talk? So, of course, it's something you you're all aware of is that deep learning is very actually very hard for geometric data, and a lot can be done on a single shape. So, there's already a lot you can do just by looking at a single shape, uh, and uh, learning from the fact that you have repeated details and trying to average, to take advantage of shape similarities. And maybe the most important thing is that don't throw away the geometry information. Try to use it, uh, even if you are only interested in images, because it might really improve almost at a, at a very limited cost. It, it might improve your, your, your uh, image task. And uh, with that, I'd like to mention that it was, of course, a joint work with a lot of people, um, and in, in, especially the two students, Matteo Climo, and uh, with, who was an intern, now a PhD student, and Olivier Pradel, which has defended his PhD. And um, you have, uh, so I, I, uh, I wrote a, a set of references you can have a look at if you, if you want to know more. And with that, um, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. <laughs>